And when you, you start yeah, you gotta you gotta follow whatever's calling you, like this, uh, like being on the beacon, and uh, take risks and develop your mastery and develop your commitments. And uh, there isn't any guarantee that you're gonna you're gonna get it right. You gotta, but if you aren't willing to take risks, if you think you ought to follow the rules that everybody else is following because that's the safe, right thing to do, you're never going to be able to become a master. You're not going to have a meaningful life. You're, not going, to, you, you're going to be in this kind of vacuum of choice. Uh, and so we go back, we want to go back in this movie to that, the experience of having the calling to become a master, to do the work and take the risk of becoming a master, and thereby becoming the center of a whole uh, community that has a language and a way of appreciating what's going on, it's still around. It happens in music and it happens in sports, but we don't, we just take it for granted. We don't notice it. We don't notice that in it is a, a, a way of life that didn't have this nihilistic uh, problem of having to make a rational, reflective choice, but having no reasons. Uh, it, it's it's all it's all because freedom and autonomy have become the highest thing, and what we have to do is ca connect up with the those marginal f elements still around in our culture, which are not questions of freedom and self legislation, and. Uh, see how they give you a sense of a power outside of you which is leading you and thereby you are not thereby keeping you from being in this kind of vacuum in which any every decision seems equal and that power is the sacred it's not doesn't have to be a, a, a theistic god it, it more like a pantheon of gods, various moods, various uh, ways that the world can call on you to do something. And we need to find where that's still around. And where that's still around is in masters, whether they are in sports or in music or in teaching or uh, in filmmaking or whatever. Uh, you, you know what, what, when you get up in the morning, what's, what's the, th the next thing to do in a way that you don't have to just arbitrarily decide. It tells you something, something shows up as now that's what has to be done, whether it's pass the ball to somebody behind you in the basketball game or go out and film uh, the latest um, something or other. Uh, you've kind of hinted about this thing of the outer versus the inner and the outside. Can you talk a little more explicitly about uh, the importance of getting out of this notion that we have an inner state of mind directed at... Yeah, uh, yeah, that's and, important. And, and if, uh, yeah, the, the kind of flow between ourselves and the rest of the world and how, and, uh, there was one other, and, and, and moods that are... Yes, I was just going to say, the good example of a kind of calling, a kind of power from outside that tells you, leads you to do what you do with a kind of assurance and uh, is moods. So we should talk about moods. Moods are very interesting. They are part of this way where everything becomes arbitrary and inner. And so whatever mood you're in, you just happen to be in that mood. It doesn't mean anything and uh, it doesn't lead you anywhere. Uh, and uh, that's it. Whereas for the Homeric Greeks, who were the extreme believers in moods, moods were whole situation defining. So as I, I mentioned briefly, so, so instead of being having a mood in you as a kind of feeling, you are in a mood. We still have that in our language. We just don't know what it means anymore. What would it be like to be in a mood? Well, Helen is in an erotic mood when this handsome foreigner, Paris from Troy, comes into their, stays overnight in their house. And that mood is just determines what's important to her, what she has to do. And she never t 
thinks twice. She doesn't say, oh, I have to leave my husband and my child. How terrible. What, what, why, what's the argument for that? There isn't any argument for it. It's that some kind of power from outside has organized her world such that the only thing she can do is, is go off with Paris. And in a culture in which moods are like that, then everybody understands because it isn't just an inner feeling. It's the, they understand what it's like to be in a situation where everybody in the situation is in this erotic mood and that determines what's worth doing and leads people to do it. Uh, I just gave this other example too of Aries, an aggressive mood. When there's an aggressive mood, then instead of Aphrodite shining on everybody, uh, Aries yells and everybody gets aggressive and goes out and the soldiers kill hundreds of people in an afternoon. And so, so as a devil's advocate, I would yeah. say, well, you're advocating just doing whatever you're in the mood to do, following your, 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 the, your whims versus rationally deciding what makes most sense to do. Yes, well, that's right. That is the devil's advocate. That's what the Kantian will say. You have to say things like a mood isn't a whim. It's a way of being attuned to a whole situation, which is shared by a lot of people who share that attunement. So later when Helen explains what she did at a dinner party, nobody says, but you left your husband and your child. How could you do that just on a whim? They all understand what it's like to have the whole situation attuned erotically and how when that happens, then there's something you feel drawn to do and you should. The, the funny thing is in Homer, the, the people who ba do bad things are always the people who stop and reflect and justify what they're doing. The, the, the bad guys are the suitors. The suitors aren't in any kind of mood. They are in a, we, we have every right to be here and take and use up Odysseus's goods because his uh, wife uh, Penelope won't choose one of us. But, uh, and they, they, they've got no feel for the whole situation. They are each one trying to figure out how to gain advantage on their own. They're autonomous, all right, but they're the bad guys. Uh, the prophet comes in and tells them that they're all, they're all wrong, that they don't understand, they, they don't, they're not in the right mood, this is not, they don't understand the situation, and they don't understand the prophet. Uh, so the fact that moods come and go, though, is yeah. that different from, well, it seems like we've got two things going on. One is the master who's ordered his whole life Again, on this calling, which seems to be like a, a world-defining calling, and the other is the mood, which changes from moment to moment. Okay, so well, okay, I see. Well, good. It's the the mood doesn't change from moment to moment. The situation lasts. In the case of Helen, it doesn't wear off for I don't know. I think eight years or so. I I don't know if it's, it's very clear. After she's been married to Paris and living with him in Troy for a while, she says she got tired of it and she wishes she was back back with Menelaus in Greece. But in the meantime, that's been a long time. So moods can be lasting and uh, but but now we comes the important point no way. we don't i mean that's the homeric story we we could it would be nice to get some of that back because we've got to face up to the fact that moods do determine a lot of what we do and they're always there in the background and they have a big power over us more power over us the less we notice them and that we should and we can that we can't just change them at will uh, so we better be able to figure out how to get in sync with them and other people get in sync with them. But that's not our, and, and getting some of that back would be a good thing. So you could get the experience of magic realism. I mean, if you read A Hundred Years of Solitude, all these people are in their various moods and understand the, the, the different worlds that the other ones are in. They're still polytheists, only they don't have gods left, but they have overwhelming situations. But the, the, uh, what was I, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, here's for what you, what you want to say, Tao, is important. We've, we've got a different sort of calling. Moods are just an interesting example, which has been lost and was once very important in Homer. And people who understand this want to bring moods back and make them important again. That's what Melville is doing in Moby Dick, among other things. Moby Dick is all about moods. The opening 
paragraph of Moby Dick is, I was in a drizzling mood, and whenever I'm in a drizzly mood, I take to the sea. And so, and, and that's, a, and he stays in that mood until after a while at sea, a better mood comes over him. Uh, but that's not our general way. Our general way is ha when our callings are not moods and gods like Aphrodite and Ares. Our callings are callings which once came from a un from a one God who was constant, who called us and gave us one job for life. Now we don't have the, we don't need that God around who's constant, but we still have the experience of being called not just for a while. And, and, and but for a whole life, and th that is, we're we're called to some kind of unconditional commitment. Romantic love may have been the last clear example of it, where you don't choose who you love, and you don't choose w w to fall in love with them, and you don't choose to love them just for a while. But in some sense, it's for eternity or forever. And now. And that worked for a while. I mean, for a long time in the culture, that that other romantic tradition comes down to us. And but now it isn't. It doesn't. I mean, anymore. It. it I mean, if the students don't believe in romantic love, it, is, it isn't an answer to Sartre to say that uh, when you find the person that really ma that really is for you, you'll know it and you'll stop fussing around about making arbitrary decisions and, and having fleeting moods. So the question is, how do we g get what they got with their Homeric gods or what the medievals got with their supreme being giving them uh, uh, literally a vocation? You're going to be a monk. You're going to be a nun. You're going to be a king. And, 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 how, and then we got to our romantic love, which is much more individual, but not fleeting, but forever not inner, but open to the whole world. But that doesn't work anymore. And so now the question is, and it's a hard one, what's going to take the place of that kind of openness to what is uh, calling us? Well, doesn't, or, the, doesn't the master, the artist, the hero, isn't he or she receptive to the mood of the culture and focuses in, it in for us? Exactly. That's the next thing to say. Yes, where we're going to have to look for whatever it is that uh, gets, gets us back in touch with what keeps us from having this sense of not having any reason to do anything rather than anything else, we've got to look to those who still do have a sense of something that's calling them, that they can do their whole life work around and that can bring in other people too and is going to be a kind of shared world and see how we can, even though we're not all masters, somehow share in experiences like that, which are, and maybe they'll be less dramatic. I mean, maybe we will have to share in experiences which are sh short term and local, like celebrations of weddings and graduations and birthday parties and so forth. Still, they are not sort of arbitrarily chosen and they're not inner. They have their mood and they're shared. So the question is, and I don't know the answer, maybe by the end of the f movie we'll know the answer, how much, what are, what are gods now that can do the job that gods did once? Uh, what a, it, it, clearly, they're not magical, and they're not somehow in some supernatural realm. But there are divinities and sacred th sacredness around, and uh, an art, artists are one of the. Uh, I'll start back. There are still something like some some modern form of what it is to be divine and modern form of what it is to be the sacred. And our, and our study of masters is the clue to what it is. And once we see it in the masters, we have to see it in our lives. And that's, the, that's where we end up. That's our final job. Right. OK. Something, I mean, I think you, we, can, we can still go on. Because right. um, something that's interesting is how, uh, although it, you know, mastery gives meaning large, you know, worlds or whatever, there's also local practices, right? There's also yeah. the idea that there's meaningful events in our lives 
that are very simple, but yet we somehow we've forgotten. That's right. I, there are, that's what I said when I said graduations and birthday parties, but also you could say family dinners and so forth. There are meaningful events which give us a shared world in which everybody's attuned in the same way. It is something like the Homeric Greeks, but it's not moods anymore. It's uh, these kind of focal occasions. They're still around, but they're being, we're losing them because they're not efficient and everything, and they're not rational, and they're not freely chosen, and all these values which have become so important gradually since Descartes and the Enlightenment seem to drive out all forms of receptivity, whether it's having a big deal calling or having an artistic calling or having a local uh, event which is clearly worth celebrating and draws people together. All of that is sort of on the defensive against the rational, technological, efficient way of life, which seems like the right way to live, except that if you try to live rationally and efficiently, it turns out there's no reason for doing anything rather than anything else, um, and, or not, or, nor even any reason why you should be rational or efficient. I mean, the whole thing just self-destructs. So, so, so let's talk a little bit about the person uh, is, is who, who is in tune with the mood, and let's say it's a musician, and he or she is uh, is really feels the importance of this music in their culture, and they feel like they can focus it in. Uh, now you can imagine at a young age they start to just feel that they should be playing their guitar twelve hours a day because they have a long term goal to do this, or does it just feel like the right thing to do, so it's what they do all day long? What's to stop them from going out and, and, and having fun with their friends, and instead it's, they're focused into just practice all day long and, and develop this mastery? Because obviously it takes years and hours of dedication, and it seems in a way different from That's true. doing what you're in the mood to do. That's <laughs> right, but it is, it is the last, latest version of, of, of a calling in which, uh, with no caller anymore, but there is the sense that there, you're on this sort of beacon, and when you're on it, you're, mo you're most alive, and you're doing what you feel you ought to be doing, and are doing, and you're at your best. And then when you deviate from it and you go out with your friends, and when you should be, when you might be practicing, you will feel uneasy and you won't feel happy. And so there is still beacons like that, and there are still pe people. Those are the masters who are on those beacons, and. We don't have to have a story of where those beacons come from. That would be kind of fancy theology and metaphysics. We know they're there because people actually live that way. And we know two things that are important, that they're endangered by the whole efficient, rational, technological emphasis on, on freedom and autonomy. And we, what the two things that I want to say we know they're endangered by that. And that they're not for everyone, but there somehow has to be a way of tr transferring what we learn from the masters into something that people can find in their lives. And we well, know... I think we should focus in a little bit also on the master themselves. And their, uh, oh, absolutely. Because the, the, I mean, in these worlds, they're local worlds, right? The sports world, the flamenco world, the chess world. Right. Uh, there's, uh, there's, you know, I mean, uh, what, what distinguishes in the sports world the, the one who decides to devote his whole life to becoming the best and become like the standard by which everyone will measure themselves versus somebody who just, uh, you know, it's fine and, yeah. Uh, goes, yeah. yeah, and I don't think they devote themselves to becoming the best. We have to remember to ask them when we talk to them. I think that the, the jargon is that they are gripped by the goods of the practice. That is, it's, it's, the, it's basketball 
not them that is making them do this. And they do become best, but only because they're grasped by the goods of the practice. And that makes them practice all the, in another sense of practice, practice all the time. And that makes them take the risks that you've got to go through and the slumps that you've got to go through and how you have to redo your stroke of whatever sort. And that puts you in a kind of regress for a while until you get even better than you were. They have to do all that because they love ba basketball or teaching or being doctors or making documentaries and that's it. So, so the calling seems to come from, from the world itself, from like the world, I mean the world obviously isn't alive but the world has this self-generating capacity where That's it, right, it draws, it draws you draws in. You so that's right, that's right. That's right. God, that's right. Is. That's good. Yes, that's good. This God is the force, the sacred force that draws you in. Yeah. That you, uh, in Nietzsche language, the sacred is that at which you are not allowed to laugh. That is the the what is serious in your life, and uh, there there is still such a force, mm -hmm. and it's got to be sort of found and cultivated, and saved so that it can save the rest of us from this lack this where this this seemingly I mean, it's all because when you stop thinking that you are supposed to be open and receiving and drawn in by what's important and that you are the independent free legislator of what's important in your life in the world that's when you head into this bad thing that we're in and and can you talk a little bit about the reason why we've, the world has gone away from that? Yes, why did the world go away from it? Well, Descartes made this huge move. He's a superhero of, of changing worlds. He just got rid of the medieval world, where callings and the sacred were all over the place, and introduced the self-sufficient subject who decides what's true and false and right and wrong. How did this happen? I think there's no, no, no simple answer to it. Something changed in the practices. It just can do that. There is something that like, and what was a new something was coming around. And namely, there was this individual things, the printing press where people could all read the Bible and the vernacular and, and make political pamphlets and so forth. Luther, who said every individual is directly related to God and we don't need all this church and mediation. And this kind of self-sufficient individualism, which is, defines modernity. And science, right? Oh, and science. Yes, yeah, science, what does science do? It shows you that uh, there is some right answer about how the universe works and you can figure it out on your own. Uh, and you don't have to look to revelation or, or any kind of authorities. It's, a very, it's very suspicious of any kinds of authority. It's, it, Kant says you should not obey the church or the pope or the prince. You have to obey your own inner principles. Uh, and how it ha why it happened? There's nothing to be said. It just happened. It's not that there isn't a cause. There are too many causes. All sorts of things converged, and the, a new world emerged. And Descartes is such a genius because after that, Kant works out autonomy and freedom. And after Kant, it gets finally to Sartre. And but it's all implicit in Descartes already. As soon as he says the highest authority is each individual human being, and the, and their free choice and their actions and gets rid of all this openness, receiving, calling, being drawn to do things, you're on the track which is going to lead us to where we are. So, so obviously there's something attractive about that. We don't want to go back to being, uh, having uh, authority over us by the prince or the pope or the church. So maybe we can go to something that's better than what we had before if we can get in touch with the receptivity, but not to the like authority that's obviously can 
be used for... That's right. Not an authority that can be a sort of oppress people and not an authority that makes people fanatics because they think they know already where, where, what, where, where you should, they should go or, what, or what's exactly calling them. Uh, yes, I think, I mean, I'm sure that if when you start interviewing the artists and, and, uh, and the masters in craftsmen or whatever, you're going to find the sense that there's something that they're grateful to, which is their beacon, and they just got it, and they, they, and they have to follow it. And what I really keep saying we're missing, although not completely missing, I mean, there's a big gap between that. The artist completely, uh, the master in any domain, completely organizing their life and their world around something which isn't even a goal because they can't tell, they, they don't know where they're heading, except they know when they're off the beam and they know when they're on the beam. That, in one extreme, and the kinds of local commemorative things, the birthday parties and weddings and graduations and family dinners and cel all sorts of celebratory occasions where there is meaning, but that seems to me there's some, some big space in between where we don't know what to say which, if we knew what to say, it would be something like understanding what the gods are now and the sacred is now. And uh, that's what we're trying to explore. When, when we talk to all these people, maybe we'll find out. Right, but then we say something about these traditions that have been going on that have the power to, to be self-preserving, and then, but they're powerful enough to save us. So isn't, aren't those maybe our gods? Isn't maybe sports like basketball and, 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 and being an artist or whatever. That's right. That's, that's, that's our part of our part of... You know, there's these strands of these social practices that are so powerful and that they can override individuals and can just sort of... Yes, I think that's it. I mean, that's what I call the goods of the practices. The goods of the practices are, which was Aristotle's term, because he was before all this modern breakdown. Uh, yes, they are part of the divine. The part of the divine is that there still is a, a, a heritage, a tradition that has its own meaning and its own power and it can draw people in. Uh, and par another part of the divine is the, that you pour, pour out libations to the gods or make a toast when you're having the, the dinner and it's really working and everybody's in the same mood and everybody finds that it's a memorable occasion. So there's, there's a lifetime meaning that your culture draws you into and which is still around in all forms of mastery. And there's this more local, more temporary kind of memorable meaning, which is the event that you will always remember of that particular Thanksgiving dinner or a uh, big deal lecture or whatever it turns out to be something important in your life. Uh, you'll remember it forever uh, and it'll help give your life meaning. Maybe that's all there is. Maybe that's enough. I mean, if you can save that from the TV dinners instead of celebratory meals and save the, the masters from the people who are just clever and exploit the current media capacities and the current taste. If, if maybe saving those two things and making them important again will be enough to save people from this lack of meaning. And can you talk a little bit about the phenomenon itself of somebody who is a master and, and, and how that recept receptivity translates into uh, actions that seem miraculous to, to the outside viewer? Like somebody seems to be aware of, of everything that's happening at the same time. Right, that's a... To act without thinking okay, and, and do okay. the right thing. Good. How does the phenomenon manifest itself? Well, that, that you just described it. I mean, there, but, and that we can do, find out by observing them, taking... Wait, um, well, we can make it, uh, you can't use what I said. Oh, I see. Yes, we, we have to, we, it's, one of the things we can explore is how one becomes a master. 
And how is it possible for somebody through all this work and through taking these risks to become more aware of the current situation in the game that they're in or in the painting that they're making or in the lecture that they're giving? How can they become so aware that they always are able to do the, the appropriate thing and at the appropriate time in the appropriate way? Hello? Hi, Stuart. It's in my car. I can get it. It's a good idea if there's a problem and so forth. Right, and what we said that you were going to pick me up at 5 till 11, right? A quarter till. 